This is a 1990 Mitsubishi Sigma, and it's a luxury sedan that pretty much nobody remembers. These were available in the United States, Mitsubishi's flagship luxury sedan, but not many were sold. But this one was, and somehow it's managed to survive till now. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era, now with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And you should, because we've had some fantastic sales recently, including this E39 BMW M5, which brought over $30,000. We've done great with E39 M5s. This E36 BMW M3 sedan sold for $25,000. and this Porsche Cayman S brought almost $60,000 in great shape. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, Cars and Bids is the place to do it with daily auctions and great selection at carsandbids.com. I've borrowed this Mitsubishi Sigma from Legend Auto Sales, which is a dealership here in San Diego that sells some quirky and interesting vehicles like this one. You can check out Legend Auto Sales by clicking the link in the description below. But let's talk Sigma. Mitsubishi was just starting off in the United States in the early 1980s, and after finding a little initial success, they gave us the Gallant midsize sedan. In 1988, a luxury model came out, the Sigma, which was based on the Gallant but more luxurious, at least for Mitsubishi in the 1980s. This is the Sigma, and today I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a tour and show you some of its quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features, the Mitsubishi Sigma, by showing you around this interior. This was the pinnacle of Japanese luxury back in 1990, or at least Mitsubishi luxury. This was the flagship model in the Mitsubishi model lineup, and it was intended to be the nicest one they offered. But truthfully, the real story about this car is just how nice this interior is. Look at how well-preserved and well-kept it is. This was, no surprise, a one owner car, bought new by somebody, and kept all these years until they recently died, and their grandchild recently sold the car, and this is a time capsule. Probably the nicest Mitsubishi Sigma left in existence, and it's truly fantastic. But let's talk luxury in this car, because there are some nice features in here that are luxurious, even by modern standards. Leather upholstery is, of course, one. These seats actually look beautiful, and they are very soft and surprisingly comfortable. They look nice, and they feel good, and I I bet they were especially luxurious back in the early 90s when leather wasn't as common. Maybe more exciting is this chrome trim on the seats. You can see going around the seat backs in the front. This is pretty impressive. Even some modern ultra luxury cars don't have this feature, but the Mitsubishi Sigma did to bring some class to this interior. And how about this? Steering wheel audio controls. You can see they're mounted here along the bottom of the steering wheel rather than like on the spokes like modern cars, but it was a good effort and very surprising. Not a lot of cars in the late 80s and early 90s had steering wheel audio controls, and this was surely one of the first, and it was a very luxurious touch. And speaking of audio, this car being a Japanese car from this era that was intended to be nice, has an enormous amount of controls in the stereo. You can see this equalizer and dozens of other controls to do all sorts of other things. This was common in higher end and sportier Japanese cars of this era, give you control over everything and increase your sound experience. But not everything in this flagship luxury car would be considered luxury by today's standards. For example, the gear selector, which is this big blocky thing that stuck out of the center and just rises up, and it doesn't look very good, and it doesn't look luxurious, but that's what car companies did back then. I especially find funny that on the top of the gear selector, they're bragging about having a four-speed automatic transmission. Virtually all, especially Japanese cars in this era, had a four-speed automatic 
automatic. It was really nothing to brag about, but they stuck that little decal on here anyway just to tell everybody about their advanced, luxurious four-speed. Also interesting in this gear selector at the base, I find it weird how the gears are displayed. You can see they're all like arrows, some pointing down, some pointing up, but they're all pointing to neutral, which is like the god of the gears, right in the middle in a green square instead of a triangle. <laughs> Everything is pointing to neutral in this gear selector base. Not exactly sure why, and it certainly doesn't look luxurious, but that was Japanese cars in the 80s. And next up, another item in this car that probably seemed luxurious at the time, but less so today would be the climate controls, which you can see are here. These operate like microwave buttons. They're not real buttons you'd push like what you saw on the stereo. Instead, they're like microwave buttons, these sort of flat controls that you push to adjust the climate control. And it beeps just like a microwave too. Take a listen. And next up, another item that probably seemed luxurious back in the day, but now it doesn't quite seem as much, is cruise control. This car has it, and it's activated with one button. You press it, and it's on. <laughs> That's it. There's no, like, set. Obviously, there's no following distance radar cruise control. You just had on and off. That's all you got. Also interesting in here, an attempt to class up the luxury of this interior in the gauge cluster, the clock says quartz going around it. This was a common thing that was advertised by timepiece manufacturers in the 80s and earlier to announce that there was like a quartz crystal helping to keep time. In this vehicle, I'm surprised to hear that there actually is, and I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't, but it says that as a reminder that this is a true luxury automobile. And next up, another item in this interior wouldn't find on a luxury car today is the seat adjustments. They are manual seat adjustments, disappointingly, and the weird thing is they're all on the side. So even moving the seat forward or backward, there's not like a bar in front. Instead, you pull this lever on the side and then sort of throw your weight, and that's how you move the seat. Stranger, though, is this lever here. That would adjust the position, the height of the seat. You would pull on it and then kind of move your body up, and the seat would go up, or pull on it and then kind of push down, and the seat would go down, and that's how you adjusted your seat height, which was common back then, but kind of unusual by today's standards. But anyway, next up, another interesting quirk, a surprise by today's standards, this car had a sport mode. This button here in the center, if you push it, it goes into power mode, and if you push it again, it goes into eco mode. So you could choose whether you wanted eco or power, which I guess would be like a sport mode. The funny thing is, if you went into power mode, a little light came on in the gauge cluster next to the word power to let you know that you were driving in the sport mode, and you could really use all of your engine's horses. Also interesting in this interior, in the front, you can see in the glove box, we have the original owner's manual for this car. Probably not too many around for the Mitsubishi Sigma. Nothing particularly interesting in here. It's not a long owner's manual. This wasn't a very complicated car, but I do like the handwriting on the first page showing the manufacture date and the purchase date, probably written there on the purchase date by the original owner and buying the car. And that is cool. A total relic that perfectly fits with how time capsule preserved this car is. But anyway, next up, I want to get out of the Sigma, but before I do that, let's talk door panel for a second. And one interesting feature here is the power window control. For the driver window, it was an auto down power window, which is now quite common. But the way it worked was you pressed it, and then it sort of locked into place while the window went down. And then once the window finished going down, it unlocked and popped back out of its locked state. Take another look at that. It locks into place, the window goes down, and then the switch pops back up. This was actually common in Japanese luxury cars in the 80s and 90s, how power auto down windows worked, rather than just pressing the switch and the window going down, that was how they did it. Kind of interesting. But getting out of this car is also kind of interesting. You don't have a traditional door handle. Instead, you have this like latch thing, which you pull on, pull that sort of towards you back, and then pops open the door and you can climb out. But anyway, next up, we move on to the back of the Sigma. And I got to say, it's pretty nice back here. It's quite roomy, as you can see. It feels nice and luxurious, and the seat is just really soft and comfortable. You sit down and you sink into it like luxury cars from the 80s. It was common back then to not provide that much support for your back, but to give you 
instead a pillowy feel like sitting on a nice couch at home. Now, interestingly, this seat has three seats back here. There is a middle seat, but if you look closely, you can see the seat is basically divided into two. Even though it's a bench seat, there's a seam running down the middle, and it was really intended to maximize the comfort of two rear passengers. Now, even in the back seat of the Sigma, you had some nice touches. For one thing, little storage pockets on the backs of the front seat, which was a nice touch back then, and not every vehicle had it, including a lot of luxury vehicles. You also had these nice door panels, this brown with sort of a cream white center and then aluminum trim all throughout. These looked very good, and you had the same thing up front. Again, this brown with sort of a cream white. These colors are commonly used today in luxury vehicles after kind of going away for a while, but they were popular, I guess, when the Sigma was new as well, and they still look good by modern standards. And one other thing I love in the back seat is the third brake light, which is mounted here on the rear shelf, and you can see it was clearly an afterthought that was stuck in after this car was designed. The reason for that is that this car was based on the Mitsubishi Galant, which came out in the early to mid-1980s. But the U.S. government didn't create a regulation mandating third brake lights in cars until 1986. So this car was designed without the third brake light, then the regulation showed up and they had to stick the third brake light on there, and so they did, and it certainly isn't that well integrated. But a lot of 80s cars have a similar kind of tacked on third brake light, just like this one does. But anyway, next up, speaking of brake lights, I really love the look of the general regular brake lights on the Sigma. You can see they are huge and rectangular, like most Japanese cars at the time, but they also have this series of black lines making rectangles all throughout the brake lights on both sides, I guess to add a little bit of flair and style to the otherwise massive, ugly, boring, rectangular brake lights. Now, interestingly, the brake lights were huge, as you can see. They basically stretch from the edge of the car all the way to the middle, and the same is true of the turn signals. When they're on, they really do stretch the entire, like, half of the left or right side of the car, and that meant there was no room for reverse lights in these massive brake light assemblies, so they had to stick the reverse lights in the bumper. It was sort of an afterthought. Even after devoting this much space to rear lighting, they didn't have space for the reverse lights, and so that's where they stuck them. But anyway, since I'm back here, let's talk trunk. You open up the trunk fairly easily, you get into the back, and you can see just a trunk. Nothing especially interesting back here, although it is worth pointing out, it is quite large, so you can put a lot of stuff in your trunk, which of course, you would have wanted, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, when you close the trunk lid, you can see the badging. Mitsubishi on one side and Sigma over on the other side. And if you're like most viewers, you're probably wondering, what exactly is a Mitsubishi Sigma? I've never heard of this car. So let's talk it over. Like I said, Mitsubishi came out with the Galant in the mid-1980s in the United States. And you may have heard of that car. It was Mitsubishi's mid-size sedan all the way through like the mid-2000s. Well, in the late 80s, they decided they wanted a more luxury version of the Galant to compete with a rising number of luxury Japanese sedans, like the Acura brand, which came out in 86, and also the Toyota Cressida and the Nissan Maxima. Mitsubishi wanted a piece of that action, so they came out with this. Now, initially it was called the Galant Sigma for the 1988 model year, but by 89 they changed it to just the Sigma, and this was the flagship model in Mitsubishi's lineup in 89 and 90, before they replaced it with the Mitsubishi Diamante in the early 90s, and that was their flagship for the next like 10 or 15 years. Now, it is important to point out the Sigma was based on the Galant and shared the platform and a lot of similar stuff. It was just sort of an upscale version, and it had slightly different styling, which you mainly saw in the rear window. The Galants had a more traditional rear window with like a piece of trim more separating the rear window from the rear quarter window. But in the Sigma, they wanted it to look sort of coupe-like, and so that piece of trim was pushed back. I guess that was intended to signify luxury for this vehicle, but that's what they did. That was one of the big changes to create the Sigma. And next up, another benefit to getting the luxury Sigma over the Galant or other lesser models was the powertrain. Now, the Galant was offered with a four-cylinder engine standard, and I think it had a six-cylinder optional, but the Sigma came standard with the six-cylinder. This was a three-liter V6, and it made about 150 to 160 horsepower. Not a huge number, but again, enough to rival the Toyota Cressida, the Nissan Maxima, vehicles like this from that era. 
Sierra. Now, this powertrain is Mitsubishi's kind of famous 6G72 six-cylinder engine, and it was used in a lot of different vehicles, including the 3000 GT. The base model 3000 GT had this engine in it from the luxurious Sigma. It was also used in Chrysler models because Mitsubishi and Chrysler had a lot of connections back then, and so this engine powered Chrysler minivans, Dodge Caravan, Plymouth Voyager, for years and years, in addition to powering this rather obscure luxury sedan. But anyway, since we're up front, I want to talk through front end styling for a little bit. You can see badging, once again, a Mitsubishi logo on the grill, but a very featureless grill. None of this like crazy looking automaker corporate grills we have today. It was just a rectangle with a Mitsubishi logo in the center. And in fact, the design of this car in general is pretty simple. Boxy, yes, which was the styling of the time, but pretty simple. People were still not sure about Japanese cars and especially Japanese luxury cars since Americans and Europeans had dominated that space for so long. So the Japanese didn't want to rock the boat with any crazy design language. And this car certainly does it very simple, very boxy. And it was intended to be very elegant with all sorts of chrome trim around, as you can see. Chrome basically everywhere they could stick it, which was, of course, the sign of luxury back in the day. You even have my favorite piece of chrome, which is this little strip between the windshield and the door, the top corner, the front fender, that little piece of chrome to make sure that no surface went unchromed. All right, driving the Mitsubishi Sigma. Here's a little story for you. When I was a kid, there was a really old couple a few streets down that had one of these. And I left for college in 2006 and I haven't seen one since <laughs> 15 years. This is not a common car. They were only sold for three model years and they didn't sell very many of them. Mitsubishi just didn't have the brand equity to create a luxury vehicle at the time. And plus a lot of buyers saw through what they were trying to do, which was basically tart up a Gallant and make it a luxury car. And so they wanted like a true luxury vehicle in this segment with its own distinctive styling and look and platform. And that was the Nissan Maxima and that was the Toyota Cressida. And so people bought those instead. Now, Mitsubishi wised up and they later gave us the Diamante, which had all those things and which was at least initially a relative success. So let's talk about how this car drives. The answer is fine and <laughs> normal, actually. Um, nothing particularly unusual or crazy, although I will say it is amazing to me that this was like a nice luxury car back in the day. Um, I, I had the same feelings. I recently reviewed a Maxima, like an 88 and an 89 Maxima, and I had the same feelings about that. And this car, like, it's just so little and so underpowered and so not especially roomy and so not, like, ultra comfortable. They don't quiet the engine all that much. It's amazing to me that this was, like, nice back then, but it was. I mean, I remember living in it. it this was nice back then. Um, and, of course, this car wasn't like a BMW or Mercedes, but... It's, it gives you the idea of what luxury was, especially the luxury if you were a Mitsubishi, and that's that's what this car is. So as for driving experience, acceleration, not especially impressive. It's not really a quick vehicle, which is no real surprise. Uh, handling is slow. The steering is heavily over-assisted. The theory is it was it, they were coming past the days of manual steering, and so automakers wanted to give you really over-boosted power steering to make it seem luxurious, like it was doing all the work for you. And the drawback was, the benefit was it did feel like that. The drawback was no steering feel at all, which is kind of the, the case in this car. Driving along on the freeway, it's actually a nice and comfortable ride. That's one thing I really will give this car. Going over bumps, going over pavement undulations, whatever it is, it feels nice and comfortable. Not exactly like floaty or pillowy soft like a Mercedes-Benz or a Rolls-Royce, but it's nice in here um, and it feels pretty good. And, and there is decent interior room. It's just not like roomy like you would expect from some modern luxury car. It doesn't feel like that. Overall, I gotta say, I like this car. I think it's cool and I think it's interesting, um, but mostly I was really curious about shooting a video in it because it's so obscure. I was just curious, how did Mitsubishi do luxury at this time? And I have a strong suspicion this video will not get much many views. There's not much traffic to the Mitsubishi Sigma. Most people I know have ever never even heard of this car, but it is a car. It is a real thing. And you know, it feels like a upscale version of a mid-sized car from this era. It's just very interesting to look back and see how Mitsubishi did luxury back then. And so that's the Mitsubishi Sigma, a flagship luxury sedan that nobody remembers from the very last car company you would associate with luxury. <laughs> anyway, now it's time to give the Sigma a Doug score.
And the Doug score is here, 41 out of 100, which places the Sigma here against some other cars from this era. The Sigma comes in pretty far behind, but it's worth pointing out most of these other cars are special flagship models. The V12 BMW 7 Series, the Lexus LS400, the Mercedes 560 SEL. The Sigma is only two points behind its closest competitor on this list, the 1986 Nissan Maxima, and I think that's fair. The Maxima is a little more engaging, a little better known, and it talks to you. The Sigma, however, is far rarer, and I strongly suspect I'll never see another one.